Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Brandon Max of the Lighthouse Baptist Church in Green Island. And I wish I could say that it's good to see all your bright and smiling faces, but since I can't, you're going to have to see all mine instead. Uh, it's now been five weeks since the New Zealand government declared a state of national emergency and initiated a nationwide lockdown protocol. This, of course, was an unprecedented measure rolled out to restrict the transmission of coronavirus and intended to protect and safeguard the health and well-being of the wider public. But here's my question to you, and this is important. After five weeks in lockdown, how well are you actually doing? I mean, setting aside the global threat of COVID-19 for a moment and all the other bits and pieces you and your family are currently doing to safeguard yourselves from the virus, how well do you actually feel within yourself? You know, what's interesting is the medical professionals for the longest time have been advocating that a well-rounded health regime and a well-balanced lifestyle will actually cater towards three things. That is to say, one's physical health, one's mental health, and one's emotional well-being. In fact, the general consensus across the wider medical profession seems to be that although a focus in any one area of our lives is great, it's the broader focus across all three of these areas that consistently generates the best results. It's a broader focus uh, in all of these areas that caters towards our best general health. For example, physically speaking, I can be in excellent health, but if mentally and emotionally I'm in a mess, then that's going to adversely affect other areas of my life. And in a similar fashion, I can be sharp as a tack in my mind and physically fit as a fiddle, but if I have a bad attitude and I'm struggling emotionally in some way, then that is also likely to flow over into my daily life and living. So the best health plan is a well-rounded health plan that covers all aspects to our lives. And when you stop and think about it, that actually makes sense. Of course, the real irony in all of this is that before all of the medical journals, the health gurus and the online blogs, God has been teaching us about the best possible health plan of all. And he's explained it to us all right here in his word. And guess what God's plan covers? Yep, it's our physical health, our mental health, and our emotional well-being. So this is what I want to talk to you all about today. It's the Lord's very own health plan for us as his children. And guys, this plan works. And it will work every bit as effectively now in the midst of the threat of COVID-19 as it will any other time of the year. So to begin with, what I want to ask is that you turn with me now to Matthew chapter 4. Uh, Matthew chapter 4. Resist the temptation, if possible, uh, to just sit there and listen to me. Because I have to tell you, what I have to say doesn't really matter. But what God has to say does. So I want you to follow along with me uh, in what he declares through his word. Hit the pause button if you now have to. Download a free Bible app because there are many. But follow along with me as we read together God's word in Matthew chapter 4. Now in terms of general health, nothing seems to be more widely talked about today than the need that exists for us to manage things well physically. In fact, the general view of the world uh, and worldwide belief seems to be that if you watch what you eat and balance that with regular physical exercise, then for the most part, good physical health can be achieved. Of course, that's not always the case, but that is generally the belief system that most people hold to. If I eat right and exercise regularly, then I will achieve good physical health and I will be okay. So that sounds like a solid plan. However, God's health plan elaborates on this further. And what I love about God's health plan is that he addresses everything, leaving nothing out, so that we can find the right balance in our daily life and living. Point in case, Matthew chapter 4. Now, in immediate context here, we find Jesus alone actually being tempted by Satan for a time out in the wilderness. And it's really interesting to see how Satan works and the strategy he employs here. Because the first thing he does is seek to attack Jesus on a physical level. That is to say, he seeks to appeal to the flesh and he uses Jesus' hunger and, and his need for physical sustenance to try to tempt him. Now, we haven't got time to get into all this today, but needless to say, Jesus is hungry and he is in a weakened physical state 
And this is exactly the time Satan comes to tempt him. Now read with me in verse number three. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. So look, Jesus, if you are who you say you are, then why don't you just use your power and satisfy your hunger? But, but notice with me Jesus' response in verse number four. But he answered and said, it is written, or rather, this is what God's word declares. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, isn't that interesting? We all know that we need to eat to live. Uh, I mean, food provides us with physical sustenance, with the energy we need for, for life. None of us would ever argue that fact. And yet Jesus elaborates on it by advocating that food is not the only important thing when it comes to our physical health. In fact, he says, man shall not live by bread alone. In other words, it's not just about food or the things we eat, because we also have need to ingest God's word into our lives. Most people don't think, tend to think about the Bible in this way, but let me tell you, God's word will grant you the means and strength to live life in ways you simply cannot gather from any other food source. You know, the Gospels outline an account in John chapter 4, when the disciples came to Jesus and they urged him, saying, Master, eat. You see, they knew it was important for Jesus to eat because, like them, his body needed and required physical sustenance. But Jesus said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And therefore said the disciples one to another, hath any man bought him aught to eat? And you'll find that in John chapter 4, verses 32 and 33. So the disciples say to Jesus, Lord, you need to eat something. And they thought, based on his response, that Jesus had somehow already eaten. Of course, Jesus wasn't referring at all to his last meal because, as we have already seen, man shall not live by bread alone, but also by the word of God. You see, what Jesus was trying to teach and convey to his disciples here was that what they needed to ensure their health and well-being required more than just the input of food because they also needed the input of God. And this is, wasn't the only time that Jesus tried to teach such things. During the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, Jesus simply said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Tell me, what do you actually hunger for? Do you hunger for what is right in a world full of wrong? Because you will find that right here. And do you somehow just long to be filled and, and to be truly satisfied? Because with this, you can be. The physical sustenance of food will only take you so far in this life. The word of God, however, will fill every void and satisfy all that is lacking. Amen. You know, people are quick to adopt strict diets and to discipline themselves by eating the right foods because they see the benefits to their physical health. And yet so many of us still fail to really appreciate and understand that the most powerful thing we have access to in our lives is in fact the word of God. I mean, when was the last time you actually had a really healthy diet of this? Because I can tell you that the truths you find here will equip and invigorate you to live life in ways you simply cannot find anywhere else. I think it's interesting to note that the best physical health plan the world seems to have thus far is to combine diet with exercise. We haven't really talked about physical exercise, but thankfully God already has. I want you to turn with me now to 1 Timothy 4.8. 1 Timothy 4.8. We're talking about God's physical health plan for our lives. 1 Timothy 4.8. Us Kiwis like to stay fit and healthy by staying active and exercising. There's nothing wrong with that. But notice what God says here now in verse number eight. For bodily exercise profiteth little. And I've got to tell you, I kind of like how this is put because it tells us that, look, physical exercise can indeed be good for our well-being. In fact, references made to how it profits us. And that term profiteth used 
uh, here is the Greek word ophilimos, which literally means to be beneficial or advantageous. In other words, physical exercise can be a good thing for us to do. There are advantages to it. And again, there are, there are really no surprises here. However, God still manages to expand on this by declaring that it's not the only thing we should be focusing on. For bodily exercise profiteth little, the scriptures declare. Look, it does help. And there, there are some benefits to it. It's just that in the grand scheme of things and in the light of greater eternity, it doesn't benefit us a whole lot. And so the verse continues, and this is where we get the broader balance of things. But godliness is profitable unto all things, the scriptures say. In other words, exercising and embracing God's plan for your life, well, that is profitable in everything. Physical exercise of the body helps in a few areas, but spiritual exercise in the word of God help, helps across all areas. And then the verse continues, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is what mere physical exercise lacks. You can go for a run every day and you can hit the gym every week, but there are no guarantees and certainly no promises concerning what the future holds. But when you exercise yourself according to God's will and according to God's plan, well, there is much that is promised, both in the here and now and in the life that is to come. First John 2.25 says, this is the promise that he has promised us even eternal life. Jesus said in John 10, 28, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. This is my promise and my gift to you, Jesus said. It is life everlasting. And that is the promise for the life that is yet to come. If you have come to a point in your life where you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, then you know the promise of which I am speaking, having already received it. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, Ephesians 2.8, to which Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Guys, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the Bible is full of promise after promise concerning him and the eternal life he came to bring. The Bible tells us neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12. Jesus is the one and only way to heaven, and the gospel message is the promise in him of that life that is yet to come. And guys, this is the greatest part to God's personal health plan for you. It's that you would get saved and receive the promise of eternal life through Jesus. And no other health plan in the world can do this. I don't care how comprehensive it is. I don't care how much you diet and exercise. For bodily exercise profiteth little in the grand scheme of eternity. But the truth is, Jesus can and will secure your health and well-being across all of eternity. Amen. But you know, God's physical health plan for us is not just about the future. Because we also have a life to live in the here and now. And I think sometimes we fall into the trap of thinking that this life is going to be all about trials and tribulations. That this life is going to be all about doom and gloom. That this life is going to be full of problems and heartaches that we must endure as we wait for the promise of a greater life that is yet to come. But you know what? That is not entirely true. Read with me again verse number eight, because we are told godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that life which is to come. So there are some promises that God also gives concerning the life that he would have us to experience now. And that term promise uh, used here in the Greek is the word apangileia, uh, which means to give a pledge or to provide assurance of something. You know what Jesus said in John 10, 10, he said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now this is Jesus making a promise. 
Jesus is making a pledge and providing us with some assurance regarding the kind of life we can all have through him. And it's not an impressive life. It's not a burdensome life. It's a life lived more abundantly. That term abundantly uh, speaks of something that surpasses others in rank. It refers to that which is exceedingly great or to that which is beyond measure. So we're talking about here the kind of life that when lived with Jesus and that when lived out according to God's word will be a life that surpasses others and that simply overflows with good things. This is why David declared in Psalms 23, my cup runneth over and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. David was talking about the life he was living in that moment, not about a future life. And he simply acknowledged how God had blessed his life in such an abundant way that it was beyond his measure to contain. Is your cup running over with the life that you now have the privilege to live in Jesus? That doesn't mean that Christianity is going to be carefree life and living. There is nothing here to indicate that you will never have problems that your life won't be hard or that you won't have your fair share of challenges to face. That is not the promise that Jesus is making. But what we are told is that when you look to live life with Jesus, life just gets better. Today, we've been introduced just to the first part, to God's comprehensive health plan for us as his children. And as he teaches us through his word, our physical health and well-being requires more than just diet and exercise. Jesus declares that life is not just about physical sustenance and about monitoring the things that we eat. For man shall not live by bread alone, but also by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is God's manual for better life and living. And it's God's word that gives us all the strength to live life the way he designed it to be lived. Furthermore, even though physical exercise can benefit our general health, God tells us that in the grander scheme of things, bodily exercise profiteth little, but rather godliness is profitable in everything, giving us a promised assurance, not just of the life that now is, but also of the life that is yet to come. Brethren, my final word of encouragement to you all today, after five weeks in lockdown, is that you add to your current health regime of diet and exercise a continual, steady, and abundant dose of God's word. Because this is by far and away what will have the greatest long-standing impact on your physical health and well-being. Join me next time as we begin to open God's word to discover other aspects to his comprehensive health plan for our lives, including the way he wishes to also cater towards our mental and emotional well-being. I love you all. Until next time, may God bless. Thank you.